So do you want to go ahead and state your name as well? As I want to state your name as well as um, maybe the beginning stages of your experience here at Champaign. Okay, I'm Kurt McKay. Um, and I came to Champaign-Urbana in the fall of 1987 to do a master's degree in library and information science. I was going to be a children's librarian. Uh, I was 42, so I was old even for Gisless. And I also was just beginning to come out. Uh, I'd been a public school teacher in northern Illinois and was just totally closeted until just before I left. Um, so I came here knowing that this was going to be my chance to come out. And um, one of the things I remember is not having a clue about how to go about that, uh, how to meet other gay people. Uh, because in Rockford, where I came from, there was no visible gay community at all. Um, <clears throat> and as luck would have it, I ended up living um, on First Street in Champaign, just I'm sorry, on University Avenue in Champaign, just off First Street, across from what's now the uh, Habitat Restore. And early on, I saw a sign someplace, a poster, you know, on a street about C Street. I didn't go there. <laughs> I was terrified. I'm not good at bars anyway. And I was terrified of the place. I thought, yeah, that's too much. So I went on and, and enrolled. Uh, in, in Gisless, and that's where I really, as a Gisless student, where I really did my coming out, uh, had that experience. And uh, one of the other people you should talk to is Arlie Sims, uh, because he was the first person at Gisless that I came out to. Uh, and, and that in and of itself was um, a sort of scary experience, although I think I sort of assumed he was gay. I don't know that he'd said he was, but I just sort of assumed he was, and we'd become friends because we were both, at that point, going to do youth services librarianship, so we were in the same classes. And we'd become friends, and, and after our class, we were walking, oh, actually sort of, I think, over by where Gisless is now, um, and uh, on, on Daniel Street, maybe going to Co what was then Coslow's. Um, I have no idea what it is now. It was Panera when I left, and it's not that anymore. Um, but uh, I hemmed and hawed, and he said, do you want to tell me something? And, and I don't remember if I said, yes, I'm gay, or, do you want, or if he said, do you want to tell me that you're gay? Uh, and after that, it was, it was fairly easy. Um, but at that point, for someone new, um, and someone newly coming out who wasn't an undergrad, especially, I think, or young, even. Um, I still didn't know where to look. Um, one of the things that did exist then that other people have probably talked about was uh, the LGBT crisis line. I think it was just called Gay Crisis Line at that point, or Gay Hotline, something like that. Um, that by the time I got involved in it a couple of years later, was located in a little room in, um, oh, you're going to have to help me out with names, in the Presbyterian Church, the campus Presbyterian Church, McKinley Presbyterian Church, was in a hidden room sort of up at the end of the stairs, and you wound around up these stairs and, and went by a pizza business that was also housed in McKinley, and I never did quite figure that out. But you'd, you'd sit there in this little room by yourself and answer the phone. Uh, and there weren't lots of calls, but there were enough to, to be, you know, to make it sure that, that make people aware that there, that, that there was a need for it. Uh, and, um, and there were also lots of resources there. You know, where to go, who to, who to talk to, what, uh, what you needed if, if you were contemplating suicide or just wanted to hang out with other people. Most of the calls I remember that I got when I would sit there were, is there a gay bar, where is it? Kind of calls from visitors to town or from, from new students. Uh, so that's sort of how it started. The, the other visible organization that I wasn't involved with but that had been around for a while was... Um, 
was then called Gay Community AIDS Program, GCAP. And that name got changed later, and you probably have heard plenty about that um, already. But that was the only other thing that, that I really knew about in the community at that point. You want to know more? <laughs> so when did you um, start hearing about the LGBT Resource Center? Well, it didn't exist then. Um, but a, a campus group was created and I don't know, I honestly don't remember how I heard about it, but I heard about it at the very beginning of it. It was a group called Out on Campus, and it was formed for uh, faculty, staff, and, and uh, graduate students. Um, and initially was formed as a, a uh, social group, was the initial interest. And that was in 1992, or maybe the fall of 93. Uh, and, and I thought, oh good, I can go to this. I was, by that point, I'd been assistant to the dean of the library school for four or five years. Uh, and, and I was completely out in the library school, but that was pretty much the only place. Uh, and I'd been you know, totally supported within the Graduate School of Library and Information Science. I mean, just total support from faculty, staff. They never seemed to get tired of me writing one gay paper after another, you know, in classes when I was a student. Um, and, and I felt really very safe and, and supported there. Um, but I, I can remember going to the first meeting of that, that out on campus group uh, and, and meeting some of the people there who, who became uh, leaders over time of uh, LGBT growth on campus. Uh, and, and very early on, the group shifted from focusing on social stuff uh, to, to activism. Um, there were two members of the group um, who worked in residential life on campus. And uh, one of them was a woman named Winnie Fink. She'd been hired as a residence hall director and had been hired with the promise that her, her partner, her same-sex partner, could live with her in the apartment in her hall that was provided for her. Um, she was coming from like Texas, I think. And when she got here, the vice chancellor for student affairs uh, sent down the word, word uh, that was a, a guy named Stan Levy, that no, 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 that wasn't allowed to happen. Uh, that couldn't happen and the partner couldn't live with her. Um, the other person was a guy, and I don't even remember his name, but he was also a, an RD and had some sort of issue with, with Res Life uh, that we got involved with. So one of our core goals that first year was to uh, get that problem resolved, uh, get the, the, the promise kept that, that had been made, uh, and then to begin to change um, student affairs approaches to, to things. Uh, and because I wasn't part of student affairs then, uh, I don't know exactly how all that happened because student affairs now is very, very supportive. Res Life for a long time has been very supportive of, of LGBT people. Uh, but about the time when he left, that, that policy got changed uh, so that same-sex uh, well, so that gay or lesbian uh, residence hall directors could have their same-sex partners live in with them. Um, at the same time, some other issues arose that we got involved with. Uh, one of them was adding um, uh, sexual orientation and, um, and gender identity to the university's non-discrimination policy. Uh, to that point, uh, it had not been included. It was sort of included under the general term invidious, forms of invidious discrimination, uh, but wasn't specifically included. And so again, it took several years, but the trustees um, did add both uh, sexual orientation and gender identity to, to its non-discrimination policy. Um, also at that time, a uh, action began, I, I think maybe more 
vocally toward the creation of an LGBT office or center or whatever. Uh, and a couple of different reports have been done over the years. The most recent in 1987. Uh, uh, whoever was then chancellor, and I have not a clue, uh, had commissioned a, a report um, about um, the campus's welcomingness to LGBT people. and. Uh, and one of its primary recommendations was that a center or office or space be created for um, gay, and gay and lesbian, I think probably is, is what it said at that time, students and faculty and staff uh, to provide them with similar support to that provided for other underrepresented groups. Um, um, and that report and one that had been done some years before, and I know there are copies of both of them in the LGBT center, uh, were just ignored by the chancellor. He didn't do a thing. So at that point, pressure began to build um, to, uh, from out on campus, uh, also from student groups, from groups like, well, it's Pride now, but it wasn't Pride then. It was probably still Gay and Lesbian Illini then. Uh, to, to create such a, a center, but it wasn't until 1993 that anything happened at all. And the original, uh, the original funding was for uh, a small space in the Illini Union, which is still part of the space uh, that the center has now, but it was one office and it was shared with the grad assistants of the ombudsperson. So you'd have a grad assistant wandering in and out, and, and it was like two desks, their desk and our desk, in this little room with no windows on the third floor, hidden away, uh, and it was staffed by a half-time person. Uh, and the, the first director was uh, a faculty member uh, named Jim Lee, who I think is currently at Indiana University. Uh, it was a Spanish professor, and our thought at the time was that uh, a faculty member would have more clout than a regular, uh, an academic professional or other kind of staff person. So we went for a faculty member. Uh, Spanish was willing to release him for half time, um, and and he held the position and began doing some programming. He had a, a little budget, but not much. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how much, but uh, not enough, I don't think, even to have a grad assistant. Um, and, but he started helping uh, Pride um, and other groups start to do things more uh, and provide some funding. He held the position for maybe two years uh, and then went back to Spanish. And um, at that point, um, it was decided that it might be better to have uh, a man and a woman represented to make people feel more comfortable. Now, people still didn't come to hang out because there was no place to hang out at. Uh, so uh, at that point, um, it became still a half-time position, but it was a quarter-time uh, woman and a quarter time man and, and at that at that time Jim Jim Hall who is an associate dean in the School of Medicine here uh, now uh, became the man and Terry Rhodes who was then a counselor in the counseling center a lesbian counselor in the counseling center was the the woman um, they did the job for about four years. I think that at, at that point they got a grad assistant somewhere in there. Uh, and, and initially I think, and, and you'd have to check with maybe Jim uh, about this, but I think the funding was done through the chancellor's office. Uh, and somewhere in there it was decided quite sensibly that this was a student affairs function and therefore should be part of, the, of student affairs rather than the, the chancellor, even though having access, you know, easy access to the chancellor was a good thing. Uh, and um, 
Jim, after about four years, went back to the School of Medicine. He was in a doctoral program. And at that point, I became the, uh, the male assistant director. Uh, Lee Astorbrook, who was then dean of the, the library school, thought that was a great idea. Uh, and uh, I worked with Terry for a year until she left the university. And then Pat Moy, who's the, now the director of the, the Women's Center, uh, but who was then director of women's programs in student affairs, uh, became the, the woman uh, who, who provided the time. And she went back to school <laughs> about the same time that, uh, that Chancellor Richard Herman came up with the money for full-time position. And that was sort of through continued pressure and goading from a uh, like some people on the Chancellor's Lunch Bunch student group and, and other people. Uh, Bill Riley, who was then Dean of Students and, and Vice Chancellor, of, no, Assistant Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, uh, was a strong ally. There were lots of allies within Student Affairs by that time. Uh, and, and that's when we got uh, budgeting for a full-time staff member and, and Chancellor Herman uh, was really very supportive. He provided not only uh, funding for a full-time salary for a director, but also for a full-time salary for uh, an assistant director for nine months, uh, grad assistant funding we were able to keep, and um, a budget. And Bill Riley uh, had, well, the ombuds position had been done away with on campus, so all of a sudden her office, which was across this little hall from ours, was empty. So we got that, but we didn't know what to do with it because we didn't have any money to spend on it. And when the full-time staffing was, was given, uh, Bill Riley came up with funding um, so that we were able to reconfigure the space uh, into whatever, essentially whatever I wanted it to be. And I thought, well, okay, what we need is as big a space as we can have for people to hang out and to meet in. Uh, and then I needed an office and the assistant director needed an office, so we created the two little offices that are at either end uh, of the space. And then, of course, since Leslie's come, they've, they've gotten uh, an additional room and done some more reconfiguring. But they created money to, to, uh, to remodel that space. Uh, and uh, the chancellor essentially said, well, now you have the staff, you need some more money to, to do programming. So he gave, gave us an additional $10,000 into our budget for programming uh, beyond what we already had. Um, and and uh, that allowed us to really begin to do things. Um, and and uh, at that point when I became full-time, left Gisless entirely and became full-time, and we added Christian Kemp de as uh, as the assistant director, uh, kept our grad assistant, which had always come from some place in sort of student affairs. Um, well, no, that's not quite true. We had some wonderful people. We had one, one woman who was uh, um, a theater graduate student. Um, but mostly they came from like social work or counseling or that kind of place. Um, so we were able to keep that that money and we had some money that we were able to use to hire some undergraduate student interns to uh, to help us keep the office staffed as much as anything. Uh, but that led us, you know, to, to be able to do uh, far more programming. Um, and and Christian was absolutely wonderful. He's since gone off to the University of Vermont. But he was really good at collaborating with other units so that we were able to do things together with other, mostly student affairs, but not entirely student affairs units uh, to, to enhance the programming we could do because we weren't paying for all of it ourselves. Uh, and, and that continues on now. Um, And when I left, when I retired in 2008, uh, Leslie um, Morrow came and uh, Katie Wiesman, who's just left. Um, and um, we're sort of where we are. But other things can't changed in that, you know, in all of that time. Uh, for, for example, one of the, um, oh, 
I don't remember what his title was. One of the um, student affairs people in counseling, Mark, Good, uh, Mark Goodman? Golding, Goldman. <laughs> uh, you know, was able to make real changes in, um, in Res Life um, with the support of his boss uh, to develop a, a, a student ally program. Oh, that was another thing that happened in 1993. The ally network began. Uh, the need for, for uh, LGBT people and straight, straight people who were supportive to get some training to know how they could help students and faculty and staff, mostly in the coming out process, but not, not entirely, but also to form a network to help us know who to talk to uh, throughout the campus if a student had a problem or if we needed something or, or, or whatever um, was developed. So that was developed through the counseling center which had a sexual orientation diversity allies committee, still has that SOTA committee. Uh, Counseling Center developed the ally training and started doing them. And I know I, I went through one of the very first ally trainings because I called uh, the person in charge of it and said, I'm gay, can I still, can I still be an ally? Because I wasn't sure. Uh, and, and of course, they said, well, yeah, of course. Uh, and so that's another program that, that has continued uh, and developed, th you know, throughout the years, uh, the the uh, the program continues in Res Life. Uh, we the LGBT Center does more with the the trainings now than we used to. We used to collaborate, but now we're. I, I think Leslie is is heading them up more with the help of the Counseling Center instead of the other way around. Uh, and uh, oh, a student several years ago developed a. Greek allies uh, training module. Um, he was out in his fraternity, and that had been one of the places where people were really afraid to, to come out in fraternities and sororities. Uh, and since the U of I has the largest Greek system in the United States, uh, you know, um, we welcomed his, his desire to do that. And he'd been well received in his fraternity, was a leader there. Uh, and so he worked up a, a program uh, with help from other people in oh, whatever the National Organization of Greeks is. Uh, there'd been some interest in it there uh, as well. And, um, and he started doing uh, Greek ally trainings and got people to come. He said, what you do is you market it to the women and they bring their boyfriends. And, and that's what happened. Uh, and, and again, it, it, I think has really made a difference on campus. Um, and I'm not sure if that program's still going on or not. I, I sort of suspect it is. It, it got passed on from him. His name was Kevin Houseworth. And he's now wor working in the city of Chicago someplace, in the Chicago city government, I think. Um, but, uh, but he was able to, you know, to get something going for, for campus that uh, that was really, really good. Um, the La Casa Cultural Latina uh, and the Asian American Cultural Center, um, and I think the African American Cultural Center now also have done ally trainings for their members. Uh, they, they wanted to do that. And I, I still remember, uh, again, a guy who was in a Latino fraternity coming and saying, I want to do an ally training for, you know, for the for the uh, Latino fraternities and sororities, uh, and, and eventually said it was because he, you know, he identified as bisexual. He was just beginning to come out, uh, and and he did a great job uh, of doing that. Um, so it, it's been really interesting to see how things have changed on campus, you know, over a period of 20 years, and how many more groups there are now. That was another thing that happened once we had a full-time office, I think, really, um, was that, that different subgroups felt that they needed space of their own in terms of having a, a set of defined needs that they wanted to address that they felt couldn't be done effectively in a single group. Uh, and I think the first of those was called Colors of Pride. 
And they, they kept that name because they didn't want to dissociate. They didn't want to say, oh, Pride's doing a bad job. But they, wanted a, they felt a need for a place for students of color to look at the issues and the problems that they faced in, in particular. Uh, at that point, uh, students felt very welcome in, uh, at La Casa. And the Asian American Cultural Center didn't even exist yet. And they did not feel welcome at the Nesbitt uh, African American Cultural Center. Um, they just didn't feel safe there. And, and lots of them said that, you know. Uh, and so we were able to work with the center uh, as well to, to begin to change that. Uh, and now the, the, the director there now, Rory, Rory uh, is extremely supportive. You know, and, and his staff have been very supportive. Um, places that we never did get to, um, athletics. Um, I don't know anything about athletics. And, and so, so I think I was a little hesitant about calling up, you know, the athletic director, calling Ron Gunther and saying, hey, we know you have some gay athletes. Uh, nobody knows that except them. Uh, and I don't even know who they are, but Clarence Shelley, who is a very strong ally and who has been a major force you know, on, on this campus for 50 years, uh, got that one, yeah, almost. Um, they talk to him because they feel safe with him. Uh, and, and, and I never felt safe ab about doing that. And I think Leslie's beginning to, 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 to look at that community um, to, to see what can happen within it on campus. Uh, there still aren't any major sport gay or lesbian, or there aren't any major sport gay athletes at the professional level or at the college level that I know, at, know of at you know, big schools uh, who, who are out. Uh, there are some in, um, other sports, uh, especially individual sports, uh, but but not not uh, not anybody in the the big ones. Uh, but we know they're there, uh, or that they exist. Um, some places on campus are more welcoming than others. Uh, another one of the groups. One of the neat things about about being in the Illini Union. I, I always thought was we're very central to campus and so engineering students who um, are very heavily male and in professions that historically have not been particularly welcoming although that's changed radically uh, with the development of software com companies I, I think especially uh, but but we were close to them and so they they come over and hang out, um, and now there's you know QSTEM, which is a, a group for engineering students, primary engineering, math, science students. Uh, again, started by students who felt a, a need. One of the one of the really helpful things I think is the university system of forming a club, so that you can you can have a club. All you have to have is two officers, and and write a letter saying, we want to do this club for this thing. Uh, and then you become eligible, uh, if you follow the rules, you become eligible for funds to do things. And, and that made it possible for our student groups to, to get funding that, that the LGBT, uh, it was initially the, the, let's see, it was initially the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Concerns Office. I changed the name to Resource, resource Office and just after I left, it got center status, which was one of the things I'd been working with Bill Riley to do, just because an office doesn't sound as important as a center like the, the cultural centers uh, did. Um, we still don't have the space they do or the budgets, I suspect, although I don't know about the budget. Um, but, uh, but we've got a location that in many ways is, is good. It's, up on the third floor of the Illini Union on the Green Street side of the building. It's hidden away. You can see it if you look at the floor plan of the building. 
Uh, but if you go up there, the signage isn't the greatest. Um, I always wanted to put a rainbow, like a rainbow banner all the way up the stairs by the, by the stair rail going all the way from the lobby down to the third floor and then down our hall and around the corner. Uh, because it's hidden away, sort of, which is a bad thing if you're really out and you want to find it to get involved, but it's a really good thing if you're not out or are hesitant about being out or just beginning to come out and you want to be safe, you can come there and be fairly certain that your friends won't see you or other people won't see you who don't also have a stake in the place. And I still remember one student who said, that before he came in, and he you know, became one of our real leaders, before he came into the, to the office, three different times he went into the, uh, uh, oh, what is it, the, uh, the housing, not, not housing, the, um, yeah, the tenant union, the campus tenant union, which was right across the hall, this little hall. <laughs> and they'd say, can we help you? And he'd say, no. And then he'd leave. And it took him three times of doing that before he turned left and came into our space instead for the first time. Uh, but I, I think that really did have an impact. Uh, and, and as whatever plans develop in the future or are going on right now for, uh, for creation of a different space for all the cultural centers and us and maybe women's center, uh, that's one of the things that I think is important. You, you need a big front door with a big rainbow flag hanging out over it, and then you need a back door that's down an alley or something that, that provides that safety uh, uh, until we reach a point where people don't have to be afraid, uh, just completely don't have to be afraid. Um, one of the things that I think is of the many kinds of programming that, that happened, I, I think one of the, the things that's perhaps most important because it was completely student directed, directed was the, uh, the fact that we held the Midwest Bisexual, Lesbian, Gay, Transgender, Ally College Conference twice uh, in this 18 or so years that it's gone on. Uh, coming back from the first conference I went to, driving a big old, you know, one of those big old buses uh, back in February from Minnesota, uh, the students said, oh, nobody had made a bid for the next year. And they said, oh, we have to do it. And the conference is set up so that if everything goes well, you have two years to plan your conference after your bid is, expect, is, is accepted. Well, this was for the next year. And we had a group of students who worked very, very hard to plan a very successful conference that brought at least 1,100 students from uh, over 50 schools in six states uh, to campus for a February weekend of, of programming. Uh, and, and after that, we went every year uh, f for a number of years. And the 2008 conference, uh, we also hosted. And that conference, the students raised $150,000 for their budget. Uh, they brought in major people from all over the country. They had probably 1,500 people there. And I think it's become sort of a, a landmark conference for, for uh, MBLGTACC. Uh, we also, in 2001, added the word co uh, ally to the name of the conference because we thought that was important. Um, after 2008, students thought it was important to, uh, students who attended the conference thought it was important to uh, oh, codify it, give it a, a, an existence of its own instead of just hopping from year to year to year, you know, around, around the Midwest. Uh, and so Mike Allen especially, who was one of the heads of, of our 2008 conference, worked more hours than I would ever have done to, to create a structure that still exists to, to help the conference, wherever it is, have a little more structure to it uh, so that it wasn't a matter of sort of reinventing the wheel every, every time it was, was put on. Um, that, those are two things that I'm really proud of because uh, the, the students did it. So what are some other programs?
or what is some other programming that does such it that's not um, well, they help with the, um, the Day of Silence programming, which is a day commemorating the, the evils that have been done to LGBT people uh, over the years um, when students are silent for an entire day um, and do other kinds of programs you know, during that day. Um, we have uh, also helped them with uh, National Coming Out Day, you know, those two sort of big national celebrations uh, uh, or commemorations. Uh, we've helped when they've wanted with other smaller but no less important uh, programming. Uh, but we've also brought a, a variety of, of major speakers uh, and uh, performances usually with the help of, of another, you know, other campus units. Um, among my favorites uh, are Scott Turner Schofield, who we brought a couple of times. Uh, Turner is a, uh, a transgender um, man who is sort of college age, who did wonderful programs uh, about his experience. Uh, uh, and uh, has toured nationally doing that kind of educational work especially. I mean, he's right down there with the students. He, he spent tons of time you know, with our students hanging out, uh, lived in a dorm, <laughs> uh, did the whole thing. And we co-sponsored those with, student, with Res Life, uh, who provided us with space for him, if not part of the funding. Another one of my favorites was uh, George Takei from Star Trek who we shared that one, we, we shared uh, costs with uh, UIC uh, and with the Asian American Cultural Center uh, on campus. Uh, and George Takei was such a gracious person. I mean, uh, a student and I picked him up at UIC in, in Chicago at like eight in the morning, drove him back, he chatted with us the whole way. He had lunch with students, he took a little nap, hung out with students, um, uh, did a major program, had, di oh, had dinner with Asian American students, the Asian American Cultural Center, um, hung out then with students, did this huge program that, that drew queer students, it drew Trekkies, it drew Asian American <laughs> students, and, and he was so gracious that you know after he'd had this long, long day, like 11 o'clock at night, he's, he's signing programs and talking to students. And somebody comes up with the idea that, oh, would you, would you talk to my partner or my dad or whoever, my, my friend, on his cell phone? If I, if I phone him, and he did. Uh, he, he was just amazingly gracious. And he talked especially about his experience as a kid, um, as an inter, inter, interned person, uh, during World War II as a Japanese-American kid. Uh, he was sent from California to Pennsylvania as, as a kid, uh, along with his family. Um, but he was just an incredible person. Other people, uh, we worked with the library school to bring Ann Bannon, who is uh, one of the, one, I just saw her name on the list of uh, queer people who are going to be featured uh, during uh, gay, LGBT History Month in October. Uh, and Ann Bannon in the 50s was a student here. She was an undergraduate student here. Um, and she later wrote uh, a series of pulp novels, uh, lesbian pulp novels. Um, and, and one of them, at least, was set at a very thinly disguised U of I. I mean, you know, the street names were the same. The buildings were in the right places the whole bit. Uh, and that, that was really neat uh, to, to have her. Um, but, oh, uh, oh no, I'm not going to be able to think of her name. Um, the first guest I brought was also one of my favorites, uh, the cartoonist who wrote Dykes to Watch Out For. Alexis Bechtel or Alex? Al Alison Bechtel. Alison Bechtel. Alison Bechtel. Uh, again, just totally gracious. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never had to 
figure out how to keep people. You know, we got her a, an apartment in the Goodwin and Green apartments to use that the dance department kept for visiting guests. Uh, put her up there, took her out to dinner, you know, just did the nice things, treated her nicely. She did a program, again, that drew uh, from students as well as faculty and staff and especially uh, sort of middle-aged lesbians. We had a lot of middle-aged lesbians at that program because they really liked her work. Uh, and she's a wonderful cartoonist uh, and author. Uh, but we were able to, to collaborate with so many different uh, kinds of people and different organizations on campus. We, we did a movie. Uh, we, we hosted the makers of a movie. Uh, it was a Latino gay movie set in Chicago. We hosted that with, with uh, La Casa. And they, arranged, they came up with the idea and they arranged to bring up the producer and, or bring down the producer and, you know, and, and some of the people making the movie. Uh, and, and we showed it in, uh, in the, one of the big auditoriums. Um, and, and, and the place was full. You know, it was a Latino movie and it was, it was queer students and it was Latino students and the lights went off and, and at the beginning of the movie it's about gangsters. Uh, about gangs, not gangsters, about Latino gangs. And, and, and you see these two young guys you know, driving all over and they're trying to get away from somebody or something. And, and everybody's eating it up and, and you can hear students saying, oh, that's my neighborhood, I know exactly where that corner is, you know? Uh, because it was Chicago, the south side of Chicago. And, and then a little later, they, one drops the other one off and, and then it's nighttime and one of the, the two guys is bringing down his garbage and he brings it down, you know, the, the, the back steps and takes it out and tosses it in the dumpster, dumpster and all of a sudden the lights go on, lights go on of a, from a truck and you think, oh God, he's done for. And he, somebody gets out of the truck and comes up and it's the, the other guy and you've had no, uh, you know, no expectation of this at all and they kiss, and you just hear this uh, in the audience, throughout the audience, because it was just so totally not what they were expecting. But that was that wasn't a negative response. And then it was about you know how the one guy how how, their, how could their sort of love affair, Romeo and Juliet type love affair, Romeo and Romeo love affair develop. Uh, La Casa has always been. You know, from the very beginning, just terrific, especially uh, in terms of sharing their space with our students when, when we didn't have much space and coming up with programming ideas in uh, doing their own ally trainings, so, you know, all kinds of things like that. Um, once they had space, the Asian American Cultural Center was equally uh, supportive and, and good about that kind of thing. Uh, coming up with topics that their own students were interested in uh, and, and doing a sort of lunch and learn type, you know, things, little programs as well as, as big programs. Um, Campus Rec also, especially for, uh, for the uh, Mumble Tech Conference, the MBLGTACC conference, you know, it was really great about coming up with uses of their space uh, and, and making it available for the conference attendees. Um, we held a dance at at Searcy uh, at one point and uh, I, I suspect the next time we we host the conference or U of I hosts the conference that there'll be things going on you know at uh, at whatever MP is called now ARC um, and and that's really quite amazing um, I suspect there are still places on campus that are not are not are not unsupportive but just doesn't matter you know uh, the counseling center also or the counseling center uh, also has been extremely supportive in terms of developing uh, not only the ally program within uh, the, the soda committee but making a concerted effort to in addition to being supportive from their entire staff to hiring a uh, a person who 
you know, a gay man who specializes in uh, helping deal with, uh, with gay students in a counseling setting, hiring a woman to do the same with lesbian and bisexual students, um, and, and hosting different kinds of, of programming from their counseling center paraprofessionals, the, the, the undergraduate students who are interested in counseling type things. They all, almost always do some sort of programming as part of their work. Uh, they've just been amazingly supportive, uh, spending time you know, in their work days uh, in the center to make, make sure students know who they are, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and the Career Center also has been very supportive in terms of uh, helping to think about uh, the, the issues that a queer student might face when, when entering the job market. And that's changed. Uh, I can remember doing a program for them, oh, probably about 1991, 92, something like that, because I was on the Career Center, or on the Career, the career Council uh, as assistant dean of the library school, I was, that was one of the things I did there, uh, was placement. And so I was on this, this uh, group, a uh, part of this group of all the placement officers or career center officers uh, from the colleges as well as the uh, career center itself. Um, and so I did a program on uh, the issue, what the issues were for, for gay students. Uh, uh, in terms of coming out issues and hunting for jobs and that sort of thing. But they really did sort of become very supportive, I think, by and large after that. And the, the Career Center itself, I think, became very aware uh, of, of things like uh, the HRC's uh, uh, list of companies that are supportive, you know, and at what levels. and the list of companies that are not supportive, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, and helping students think about, okay, how do you put your, if you don't want to be out, if you feel like you can't be out when you're applying for a job, how do you put your activities that are LGBT centered or focused, how do you get those onto your resume to show leadership? Uh, that kind of thing, I, they've, they've been really helpful with. And again, uh, as they sent some of their student interns over to spend time with resume uh, counseling uh, for for students. They did that at the uh, at the cultural centers. They did that at the LGBT center as well. Uh, and I don't know. It just seems to me that that by and large the campus has become a fairly supportive place. There are still. I'm I'm absolutely certain that bullying still happens. You know, while I was still here. Uh, my last year, a, uh, a student was knocked down on Green Street by a drunk, rock va or drunk Parkland student uh, who called him a fag. Uh, and um, the students rallied and did something about it. And that you know, ended up on the end of the, the day of silence. The, oh, what's it called? Yeah, the Green Street hug in. Again, student, student organized, student conceived. Uh, we helped support it and and made sure that we had a presence there. Uh, but they came up with the idea for okay, how to respond uh, when they thought the chancellor didn't respond enough, uh, and we were also able to help the student himself, you know, with decide what he wanted to do in terms of what do you want to do with this this guy because uh, the guy got caught uh, and, and were able to provide some support as he needed it as he went through sort of that process of dealing with that. Um, so that's the kind of you know, programming stuff that happens, little programs, uh, making sure there's a TV that works and movies to watch and books to use and that kind of stuff uh, as well and just people to be welcoming and let you know when you come to campus that wherever you come from you're going to find people who are like you and and uh, and who will welcome you and and make you part of things um, but the other thing is that things have changed so much uh, in 
in the world since I came in 1987 um, when there was very little talk, there were no role models. Now there are tons of, you know, important people role models. There's, uh, there, there are um, programs like uh, Dan Savage's It Gets Better program to, to help, and Dan Savage is a U of I alum. Uh, and he might be an interesting person for you to talk to about his experience, which was ending about the time I got here as an undergrad. Uh, and uh, uh, we've gone from sort of low existence or non-existence in, in the sort of the student affairs uh, awareness on campus to, be, to being uh, an important part of it. Uh, to, to the point that, uh, oh, I think she's suing now, but a student, you know, a, a student was uh, unable to, to continue in her counseling psych doctoral program at one of the Michigan universities um, because she wanted to, she believed that we could be fixed, you know, that, that uh, reparative therapy worked. Um, and, and that wasn't somebody here, but there's still people like that out there who are, who are not supportive, who are uh, actively opposed to us. Uh, you'd find people, especially within the um, evangelical religious commu community here, who, who would feel that way. But even there, there's, you know, there's been movement. Terry Austria, who, who is the student campus life minister for, um, for a very evangelical church, you know, has been very supportive uh, of our community. And I've never gotten the sense that he's trying to save us uh, any more than he would try to say it. He's not trying to change us. <laughs> uh, saving, I don't know. Uh, and, and even within uh, some of the other, you know, really uh, conservative religious communities, students, at least in student groups, have wanted to have dialogue. Uh, they've wanted to talk with us about who we are, and, and that was just sort of starting as I left. Um, but I think that's a, a really good sign as well. Um, Illinois has civil unions, and hopefully we'll fairly soon have same-sex marriage law, you know. Uh, it wasn't long ago that we were struggling to get domestic partner benefits uh, for the U of I. And that was another thing that sort of grew out of that 93, although it didn't take its form until several years later uh, when, when some uh, folks on campus uh, really wanted to do that kind of, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and so a movement, you know, began uh, that was especially headed up by uh, Lydia Curry and Jane, oh, her partner's name, Jane, her partner Jane, who, who were both, at that point, both in the counseling center and who were domestic partners. Uh, and they were interested, I think, even though they both had insurance coverage, because a time might come and, and did when when they weren't both working for the university. Uh, and, and the university, it didn't take more than a couple of years for the university to see, oh, it doesn't cost very much to provide uh, domestic partners uh, with uh, health, health coverage, because that was the issue. Um, and so it's better to do it than to not do it. Um, and and part of the reasoning was, well, same-sex domestic partners can't get married anyway. Um, and so you had to prove, you know, that you had commingled your finances, that kind of thing. Uh, and when uh, the uh, civil union law was passed, the university changed its policy and said, okay, now you can, you can have a civil union. You have to do that to have the coverage. Uh, because that makes it, because they weren't covering opposite sex domestic partners uh, at that point. Uh, so that's another one of the sort of milestones, I think. But, but things have changed so much in the world uh, that even though there's still hate out there uh, and, and um, 
especially conservative Christians uh, are, are promoting hate, uh, that I feel like we've turned some big corners, you know, that, that things really have changed. Now, at the same time, I wonder, you know, with Pride Fest coming up, uh, I, I wonder if, well, you never would have, with the mayor, the mayor of Champaign who was here when I was, was here, uh, you never would have gotten any kind of proclamation from the mayor of Champaign saying, oh, this is a wonderful thing, we support it. Mayor of Urbana, yeah, probably, <laughs> you know. Uh, Champaign has a new mayor now, so I don't know what the deal is, but I, I, that'd be something I'd look at, like, okay, does, does the Upcenters Pride Fest, do they get proclamations from the mayors of both cities and the Champaign County Board saying, right on, good job. Um, so there's, you know, there's still lots to do. Uh, the LGBT center won't, won't become redundant for a long time, I don't think. Uh, but I think its job is going to change uh, from, and I think has already changed, uh, from the time when it was an office of LGBT concerns, uh, because it was things we were worried about and trying to fix, to an office of LGBT resources, where it was, here's the things we can do to help. Uh, and, and I think that that will just continue to, to develop uh, in positive ways. Yeah, so I think the space is Use for something else. Something else okay. Cool.